Hey guys, welcome to the Eight Limbs Podcast. I had to take a couple weeks off because I got busy with work, but shit's been pretty crazy lately, so let's dig right in. I thought I was going to start this off by talking about Adesanya Romero, but that turned out to be absolutely awful. So instead, I'll recap the last UFC card. The main event was Charles Oliveira versus Kevin Lee. And it actually turned out to be a pretty awesome fight, which is surprising given, given the like, general trajectory of the UFC lately. MMA's been kind of shit. But Oliveira is really starting to put everything together now, and it's great to see him finally get on a win over somebody who's kind of on the edge of the elite. For a long time, he was one of those... Ah, uh, like mid-level journeyman guys who did a lot of cool things but never really had the tools to consistently beat elite opponents. But he's really started putting his game together lately. What he used to be kind of a, the typical Brazilian jiu-jitsu glass cannon where his wrestling wasn't really good enough to take down the elite and he was really vulnerable on the feet. <clears throat> he would stay at range, covering up behind kind of a static high guard that he never really wasn't responsive in any way. He wasn't really seeing punches coming. So he ended up stand, stranded at range, being kind of a mark for body shots and straight punches. But recently he's turned into a really effective pressure fighter. And it fits with his game really well, because his takedowns come either mostly from the clinch or reactive takedowns. And now that he's, he's moving forward, putting a pace on guys and pushing them back, he can get into the cage, get in on his, on his clinch, on his double collar tie, and... When, when guys like slash out to try and throw off the pressure, that, that's when he can hit his reactive takedowns. He's also opened up his kicking game, which was always kind of there, but it was never great. He was never the kind of guy who could like dazzle people with finesse on the outside. But now that he can force guys onto the back foot and move forward, it's opened up his kicking game a lot. He, he was nailing Lee with some really good front kicks here. I was especially impressed with the work Oliveira was doing when he hit him against the cage. He wasn't freaking out and uh, like spazzing and giving Lee opportunities to escape. He, he was really composed. He was working with his lead hand a lot, feinting, uh, jabbing, jabbing into left hooks <clears throat> to get him to draw out reactions to land his right hand. And he would just extend his lead hand a lot at times just to occupy Lee's vision, uh, make it, force him to move his head and then exploit it, and to measure his distance. His right uppercut when he had Lee against the cage looked really good. He was doing a great job of drawing Lee onto that with feints and the probing lead hand and everything. And I love how his kicking game has come together, too. <clears throat> Again, in his last fight, I think with Jared Gordon, some, yeah, I think that was his name. But Lee was, not Lee, sorry, Oliveira was using a front kick really nicely to, to push him back and maintain distance. Um, he was doing that here against Lee, too. He landed some really nice body kicks. One of the one of the things about his kicking game that really works with his new kind of pressure style is that it leads onto his front headlock. So his grappling game is kind of built around that front headlock. When he's walking guys down and getting that, getting to that double collar tie in the clinch, he'll work with knees, and it, what it does, it like folds the opponent in half, so they, they're encouraged to bend down, and then he can like snap them down into guillotines, lock up a front headlock, and go for his darces or anaconda chokes and everything. And the kicks kind of do the same thing. <clears throat> like Lee wasn't really able to get into clean takedowns. He, was, he had to kind of struggle for them. And one of the biggest things was that Lee was doing, he would shoot when Oliveira kicked. But it wasn't, it wasn't like clean kind of shots where you, you, a leg kick rides up your leg and you catch it and just dump them. He would get nailed in the body and kind of take like a desperation shot. So Oliveira was kind of drawing out those poor shots with his kicks. And then the finish came once Oliveira, I think he cracked him with a front kick to the body, and it looked like a pretty clean shot too, I think probably hurt Lee. And then Lee kind of shot that desperation takedown, but it was, like it wasn't clean. There was a lot of space there, because he he just gotten kicked and he didn't really, uh, he didn't like get the entry put together really well. And he was already worn out from Oliveira just walking him down. 
uh, gassing him out and whooping his ass on the feet. And that space wasn't just enough for Oliveira to lock up the guillotine. And he finished him from half guard too. It was uh, one of those power guillotines. It's a really nice one. There were a couple other cool fights in the card too. Francisco Trinaldo and John McDessie had a fun striking match. They're they're both a little past their prime at this point. Trinaldo's like 56, and McDessie's kind of winding down in his career too. But it was at least worth watching. Um, <clears throat> so the basic dynamic of it was McDessie kind of struggles with self pause. He's a he uses his lead hand and lead leg a lot, pairs them together with the jabs and inside leg kicks, and he was kind of den- denied that against the southpaw Trinaldo. Trinaldo was controlling his lead hand really well, so McDessie couldn't work in and out with jabs. McDessie landed some nice counter hooks, counter left hooks when Trinaldo came forward, but he wasn't doing it consistently. Trinaldo didn't really need to, to close distance to hit him and could kind of pick him apart from the outside. Trinaldo did a lot of really good open side kicking. He was slamming him with body kicks and leg kicks, landed a head kick or two too. And he was setting him up really nicely, like feigning the straight, doing the hip feints and everything. Magdesi kind of got predictable with circling outside his lead leg, and he wasn't really offering any threat when he was doing it. So he would try to take the outside angle, but he wasn't he wasn't like disguising his his footwork or anything. He he wouldn't like jab into it, and then once he was outside, sneak a right hand in. He would just kind of try to back up and circle off. And he, what he was doing a lot was stepping back with his lead foot when he was trying to pivot. So he was kind of taking himself out of position removing his base to hit. And then Trinaldo, at first Trinaldo was, was whiffing a lot when Mekdesi would circle outside his lead leg, but he caught onto it and started pivoting inside and throwing the straight when he did it. Like the, the thing that Conor McGregor does a lot when he, he kind of like baits people into circling, circling outside his lead leg and then just pivots with his rear foot and cracks them with the straight. <clears throat> Mekdesi probably needed to make exchanges happen to win, but I don't really think he's that guy anymore especially against his southpaw. Um, he just didn't really... He kind of looked content to lose like a low-volume fight. But Trinaldo did some really cool work on the counter, too. He was using combinations. Uh, when McDessie would come in, he'd slip a shot or pull back and then counter in combination. He landed a really lovely counter uppercut to the body. I love that about Trinaldo. He rocked uh, Kevin Lee in their fight with an awesome counter uppercut to the body, too. Made Lee hunch over like he had to shit. Magdessi was using a lot of outside low kicks, but they were kind of like the... <clears throat> I'm, I'm really critical of how MMA fighters kick. There, there's like a few genuinely great kickers in MMA, but most of their kicking games are really patchwork and not put together well, and they lack ancillary skills around their kicking. And Magdessi was doing like the typical outside... the typical MMA fighter outside leg kick when you have a southpaw and orthodox fighter against each other. If you watch uh, like Nico Price against Alan Joban, that's how MMA fighters throw throw kicks against the southpaw. They'll they like they do those shitty kind of pendulum outside leg kicks, which are fine if you have the footwork to go with it. Demetrius Johnson, if you watch him, he'll bounce in and out with leg kicks, and he'll be taking angles off them. He'll when he bounces into kick, he'll frame off his opponent's face so they can't punch him back. Uh, he'll he'll like switch stances on exit and then take angles while he's going out so they can't just counter him. But that, that light outside leg kick in a southpaw orthodox mode is super easy to counter. It's really not a good strike for breaking the opponent's balance. And if you're not doing something with it, like if you're not using it to draw out counters and then trying to punish them, or if you're not moving laterally off of it, it's just super easy to get punched in the face while you're doing that. And Trinaldo was countering that pretty consistently. Another thing you can do, like, another way to make that work is by, by not throwing it, like, with a pendulum, the hop step in. If you watch, like, Moicano's fights, especially with Cater, he'll, he'll throw the outside leg kick as a switch. He'll, like, take a switch and then hammer the lead leg, which is fine, because it, if you can punt them off balance, then they can't counter right away. It's just that, the light, light tapping outside leg kick, that's really not a good idea if you're not doing something to avoid counters. But that was a pretty cool fight. Um, Elizio Zaleski Dos Santos and Alexei Kimchenko is also worth watching. Dos Santos ended up winning a unanimous decision, but it was a really bad decision. Kimchenko pretty clearly worked him over in the last two rounds. I'm not going to talk too much about it, but Kimchenko did some cool boxing things. 
and he he like adjusted well throughout the fight too. In the first round, there was one point where um he he tried to come in with the right hand, and ZDS slipped outside it and countered with his own. And then in the second round, a similar exchange happened, but this time uh, Kunchenko avoided the counter and doubled up on the right hand and hit him. So that was pretty cool. Kunchenko, I like Kunchenko's game a lot, but he really struggles from inactivity and just low volume overall. He's kind of a five-round fighter. He was... This is a problem that a lot of people who are champions in other organizations have when they come to the UFC and start fighting, like, mid-level welterweights in three-round fights. He, he's fighting like he's expecting to have two more rounds to build on everything. And he does that really well. Like, he makes reads and he builds on his work. Uh, he'll take um, anything he's having success with early, he'll, he'll craft that into something else. If you're biting on his jab, he'll hook off the jab and set everything up off of it, etc. And he'll learn how to take his opponent's weapons away and kind of figure them out through the fight. But you don't really have time to do that in a three-round fight. And a lot of... He seems to just run out of time a lot. He did it against Gilbert Burns, and he did it here against Zaleski, kind of, even though he clearly won. So I like Kunchenko, and he does, he does some cool things, but he's probably never going to be a top fighter, especially at this point. He's 35. Moreno and Formigo is a great fight, too. There's a lot of fun scrambles, but that was mostly a grappling match. So it's kind of outside the scope of this podcast. Now that we have the MMA out of the way, there's a lot of interesting fights that happened in Muay Thai over the past few weeks. The one that got the most fanfare was Rod Tang versus Kayonar. Rod Tang is ranked number 3 at Lumpany's 135-pound division right now, and number 5 in Raj Dandern's 135-pound division. Kayonar is ranked number 1 at 130 in Lumpany, and number 6 in Raj's 135-pound division. If you listen to the if you listen to my podcast when I talked about Rod Tang's fight with Yadlek Pat, I, I mentioned how he doesn't fight elite ties the same way he fights foreigners. If you look at the Jonathan Haggerty fights, he's like a rampaging destroyer. He goes forward and just beats the body, works the body and head over, and just beats the shit out of his opponents. <clears throat> he but he can't really afford to fight like that against ties. Against the odd luck pet, he, he was fighting off the back foot. He boxed him up. It was a really good performance. But it was also, he, he had to adjust. He, he can't just go forward and beat the shit out of elite ties. And this KNR fight is kind of another example. KNR is a slick outfighter. He uses like outside footwork and kicks to keep opponents at distance. And then he's got a good clinch game with a lot of trips and dumps. Rod Tang was trying to pressure him, but was largely unable to find uh, like clean exchanges. KNR was keeping him on the outside. And then when he'd get close, KNR would go to the clinch. Rod Tang is really good at using leg kicks to stand guys still for his flurries when he's pressuring. But Kionar, when, when Rod Tang tried to kick him, Kionar would pull back and immediately counter. Or he'd, he'd just eat the leg kick and then counter with a kick on the arm, which scores higher than the leg kicks. When Rod Tang did back Kionar up to the ropes, he would use reactive clinch entries to, blake, to break up his flurries. So Rod Tang would get in and try to open up with like a jab, cross hook. And KNR would, would use a long guard to cover up and either pivot out to the side or just clinch him. Rod Tang didn't have much success with his offense in the open. He couldn't really get the distance down. KNR was, was out kicking him and teeping him and everything. Um, and he had to walk through a lot of kicks to get KNR to the ropes. KNR did a really good job of like drawing out attacks to, to kick the body. He, he would like feint or hand fight to, to encourage Rod Tang to step forward with a punch and then intercept him with a southpaw body kick. Rod Tang's attacks in the open looked pretty predictable, but when he got him on the ropes, he did some decent work with flurries. Later in the fight, um, Rod Tang did a decent job earlier, but KNR stopped getting ground so easily around the fourth round and started countering and clinching more. When Rod Tang advanced with his combinations, he'd usually open up with a jab or lead hook and try to set up his rear hand. And KNR started using a long guard or a high guard to intercept that hook and clinching when it fell on his shoulder. So when you when you throw the hook and the guy blocks it, there's an opening there for them to wrap the arm around your head and enter the clinch. KNR also did some really good elbow counters when Rod Tang stepped in to fire off the rear hand. He'd keep him uh, like a a step away from him, so he'd have to step in with the jab and cross to land. And then as soon as KNR saw the jab that he was using in close distance, he'd fire off an elbow. In the last round, Rod Tang really sold out, sold out on his aggression to make up for the lost ground that he'd 
for losing the last few rounds. And KNR basically just kept shooting reactive body lock takedowns. He would, he'd like back him up to the ropes and try to tee off. And Rajang, or KNR rather, would literally just duck in on his, on his waist and hit body lock takedowns. And then he, he passed him out at one point. Looked like he wanted to set up an armbar. Probably would have taken his head off with ground and pound if the ref didn't keep standing him up. But yeah, it was a really great performance from KNR. Especially impressive considering he's like 30 years old which is extremely old for a tie. Surprising he's had so much success at high-level stadium Muay Thai. Rod Tang's next fight is on March 30th against Chorfa Torsang Tinoy. Or I guess it... Yeah, I don't know if that's going through anymore because they're canceling everything for coronavirus. All right, I guess I won't talk about future fights on this podcast because they're probably not going to happen. Um, yeah, Lumpany just canceled all their events after I think like nine guys got coronavirus at the same event. So there's probably not going to be a lot of Muay Thai happening in the near future. Kianar was scheduled to fight Yadlik Pet next month. That's a bad fight for Yadlik Pet. But as I said, I don't know if that'll go through either. There was a lot of great Muay Thai over the past few weeks. A couple titles changed in. There were some impressive finishes too. We'll go through the rest of the important stadium fights in chronological order now. Rak Erwan and Dom Tong Luk Jiao Porong Tom. Yikes. Fought for the Lumpany 108-pound title on Friday, March 6th. These are tiny boys. You usually don't see a lot of finishes in the high-level Muay Thai, but Rak Erwan beat the fuck out of It was a slow-kicking match for the first two rounds, and then suddenly in the third round, Erwan decided to stop feeling him out and just beat his shit in. He started consistently countering Dom Tong with a lead leg body kick and selling out hard on leg kicks. Beat his leg up pretty bad. When when Dom Tong covered up and stuck around at range, Erwan was battering him with combos. Um, he he manipulated the guard really well, using hooks to widen his hands and then sending uppercuts through it. Whenever when Dom Tong got tired of just being flurried on and started pushing forward, Erwan chewed him up off the back foot. He landed a lot of nice counter right hands and elbows. <clears throat> um, D- Dom Tong eventually forced his way inside into the clinch, and they got into kind of an elbow battle. They were both like slipping and blocking elbows, and Erwan suddenly framed off to blind him and used that frame with the forearm across his face to set up a big counter elbow that dropped Dom Tong. After he got back up, Dom Tong tried to brawl his way back in to gain some respect after he got knocked down, but he kept getting caught by heavy rights and elbows. Erwan stunned him with the right hand and then proceeded to just knee and elbow the shit out of him until he collapsed. So that was really cool. I mean, I'll have to keep an eye on Rack Erwan for really liked what, he's, what I saw from him there. The day before that, on Thursday, March 5th, Chalam Perinchai fought Vu Pech Kassin for the Lumpany 126-pound title. Chalam got started pretty early. Usually ties take like a first round or two off, but Chalam was landing some attritional work, uh, kind of wearing him down with leg kicks instead of just stalling out the first round. He wasn't... He wasn't pushing like super hard, but he at least took the opportunity to do some attritional damage, which was nice to see. If you watch Golden Age Muay Thai, it wasn't they didn't have the like take the first two rounds completely off and then only fight in the third and fourth and maybe the fifth if it needed contesting. But I don't know exactly what changed, but I've heard it has a lot to do with gambling. But it's kind of annoying, especially if you're not um especially if you're like a foreigner not used to Muay Thai and you're watching it for the first time. You're like, why are these guys stalling and not doing anything? So it was cool to see Chalam at least use the first few rounds to do something. Vu started switching stances later, so the leg kicks might have bothered bothered him. Chalam's right hand looked really solid, especially when Vu went southpaw later. He was landing it on entry using hop steps to close distance. He was punching off his kicks, so he'd throw like a round kick to the body, and when Vu blocked it, then he'd step right into the right hand. He landed a few times as a back foot counter too. Uh, he was playing the, the double attack well when Vu went southpaw, fainting, using hip feints to land the straight and then showing his straight to land kicks. There was a lot of outside kicking early, but Chalam was getting the better of it. And he was also punching off his kicks too, where uh, Vu would just throw a kick and then kind of back out if it was blocked. But when Vu was blocking Chalam's kicks, Chalam would step into punches and use it to work off of. Later, V didn't like the outside game too much and started pushing forward into the clinch. Chalam landed some nice intercepting knees. 
uh, when V was closing distance on him. They clinched pretty much the entire fourth round, but they were mostly smothering each other's work, and neither could get too much space to land like strong knees or elbows. Chelan landed some decent elbows and knees as V stepped into range, but the clinch was uh, kind of inert. The fight was kind of indicative of a lot of problems I have with the clinching in the modern game. The ref breaks them up so quickly that it's a lot easier to stall, and they're not really encouraged to work out of positions. So you'll see guys, they'll get tied up, and then instead of, instead of trying to work out, they'll just grab on and hold. But overall, it was a decent fight. Uh, the clinch was pretty close, but Chalon's work at range sealed it for him, with, with the um, fainting his kicks into right hands. On Wednesday, March 4th, Sexan fought Tananchai. This was for the Roger Damner and 135 pound title. These guys fought in January, and Tananchai tried to take Sexan head on. They're both really fast paced pressure fighters who love a good brawl, and they ended up having an awesome fight. Tananchai took a more finesse based route this time. He still exchanged with Sexan a lot, but he was employing consistent lateral movement and pivoting out after his combinations instead of just sticking around and trying to meet force with force. Tananchai did some really good work with combinations. He was using punches to set up kicks and knees well. He was also landing some great stepping knees. Um, he got a little bit predictable with his footwork. He was kind of using the same pivot over and over again and moving in the same direction. Sexan started to time his pivots and would turn with him and throw a kick. The finish, I think it was in the third round, kind of came out of nowhere. There didn't really seem to be much leading up to this, but they found themselves in a loose clinch where both were kind of framing off, but neither was really controlling and there was a lot of distance. Tananchai kind of seemed to be like resting his right arm and wasn't really doing much to block Sexan's line of, line of sight or control his posture or like bar punches. And Sexan loaded up a massive kind of like diagonal elbow that knocked him out. He put so much weight into it that he basically flung himself to the floor and Tananchai stumbled around a bit and just slumped over. It was crazy. Before he threw it, Sexan drew his arm down a little bit like he was going to disengage and I think it caught Tananchai by surprise. But the fight was a lot of fun while it lasted, and the finish was sick. Glory 75 was on Saturday, February 29th. There wasn't a ton on it. Petch Panamrong bought Serhi Adamchuk again. Uh, Yusri Balgarwi beat up some guy that I've never heard of. Beat him up really bad. And Harut Gregorian pulled a Harut Gregorian and shot the bed massively against Jamie Bates. That fight he was expected to win pretty soundly. Um, I'll only talk about the Petch Panamrung fight here. Petch Panamrung kicked him up the entire fight, Sir He Adam Chuck. He intercepted his forward movement with teeps and body kicks really well. And whenever Adam Chuck left the pocket, he would land leg kicks on exit. Adam Chuck was trying to pressure him, but he wasn't really able to find exchanges consistently. He was constantly shelling up behind a high guard, which didn't really help his pressure. When he was coming forward, Petch would just fire off a few jabs and then he'd cover up and kind of stay still and it would give Petch an opportunity to either pivot out or just work over his body. Petch's jab looked really nice in general. He was using it to set up his kicks and force Serhi back, as well as to angle off and pivot when he came in. And he was converting his jab to a frame when Serhi tried to push for exchanges. So he would fire off the jab a few times and then lay his forearm across either Serhi's face or his, his gloves and just push him off. He'd use that either to create distance by shoving, or to just bar him from entries. Sir, he would come in and he'd frame off, and then he wouldn't be able to get off any clean punches. Petch Panarung's boxing and defense looked great. His head movement was really good, and he was slipping Suri's punches in the pocket. Uh, he was, like, dipping under jabs and counter-jabbing and pivoting off. And whenever he'd throw his leg kicks, he'd proactively duck after, so Adam Chuck wasn't able to just step in and counter him off those. This, this fight from Petch Panarong is a great example of why closing distance is so important for outfighters. He put on an outfighting masterclass, but he barely had to move. When you have guys like, to use an obvious and a bit of a cheap example, like Gustafsson, when they want to maintain distance, but the only way they have to maintain distance is by backing up and circling off. First of all, it gets tiring. You have to move so much more than your opponent. And by, by the later rounds, like round four and five, all that movement's going to take its toll. But it's also fundamentally not a good way to, to get yourself back in position. If you have to circle the entire perimeter of the ring just to, just to take an angle on the guy or to escape the cage, then the one who's in the center of the, of the cage or ring or whatever has so much less distance to cover. They can just pivot on their rear foot and track your movement laterally, and they barely have to move to keep you in the same position. 
but if you can close if you can close distance and find find spots to execute tight pivots or or step into the clinch it's an incredibly important tool for for outfighters because it allows them to enforce that distance without without moving so much without taking themselves out of position and whenever adam chuck stepped in Petch wouldn't just back up and circle him off and invite him forward to pressure. He would meet him in the middle and get close enough to smother his punches, either in the clinch or with a, the forearm frame, or he would just step in and box with him for like an exchange or two and then pivot out the side. So he barely has to move at all, and then he's back in the center. At this point, there's really nothing left for Petch Panamarang in glory. I don't know if he plans to move up a weight class. I don't know if he'd, how he'd be at lightweight. That would be pretty interesting to see. But... I kind of want to see him just go to Japan or China. They both have really interesting 65 kilogram divisions, which he'd fit in well there. If he stays in glory, it seems like he's just going to be beating up the same guys he's been beating up over and over again for a while. There was a road show on Friday, February 28th, with a lot of great fights on it. It was headlined by Sagmini against Tananchai Rachanon, not to be confused with Tananchai, the guy who fought Saxon. But, um,. <clears throat> There was also Kupai Chipwangnon versus Lambda Moonlek or Acharya. Pet Yutong or Quan Wang against Rungkit Bor Rungrot. And Pet Somjit Jitmoingnon against Pet Somai Sorosomai. All these guys are either top three fighters or champions. I think the road shows are kind of like outside the normal stadium fights, so I don't, they don't count for rankings or anything. They're just basically super fights for fun. <clears throat> Uh, for the first fight, Sangmini and Tananchai Rachanon. Tananchai is ranked number 3 at Lumpany's 140-pound division right now. Sangmini is number 4 at Lumpany and 5 at Rajadamner. Sangmini <clears throat> is known for his southpaw boxing and left kick, and he pairs them together really well. He's one of the better examples of how to make a southpaw double attack work. And he's a super slick boxer, too. He's coming off a seven-fight win streak, and he won the Fight Sites Award for Fighter of the Year in 2019, while Tananchai was coming off a loss to Yod Panamrung about a month ago. Tananchai had a massive size advantage, and this fight was basically him just kind of grown-ass manning Sangmini. Um, <clears throat> Sangmini has beaten guys with a big height advantage before. He kicked Yod Panamrung up, who had a similar height advantage to Tananchai. When he fought Yod Panamrung, he kind of beat him up with kicks a lot. And the more the fight went on, Yod Panamung started wearing down from the kicks and saying he was able to box him up later too. But Tananchai didn't really let him get anything going with his kicks. Tananchai's length killed his boxing. He wasn't really able to land any clean punches just because Tananchai was so long in keeping him at range. And he was framing off and extending his arms to bar saying these punches. But whereas he was able to time Yod Panamarung coming forward with the kicks, kind of set up outside and wait for Yod Panamarung to step onto him before slamming him with kicks, Tananchai was blocking all the kicks consistently. Tananchai walked him down in a square stance and was constantly picking up his legs while moving forward to faint teeps and to check Sangmini's kicks. <clears throat> he wasn't doing like large committing, committed marching like you see someone like Muay Thai do. Those can expose you for counters. They, it lets you cover a lot of distance really fast, but it also exposes you for counters. You, you'll often see Muay Thai getting countered with kicks or elbows on the way in. But Tananchai was taking really small steps so that uh, he was always in position to lift a leg up to check, and so Sangmini couldn't reliably time him coming in. And he, while he was pressuring Sangmini, he wasn't trying to get inside and swarm. He wanted to keep him at length while also marching him down. So he was he was coming forward behind that like behind those small steps, constantly picking up his legs while occupying Sangmini's vision with his with his punches. When Sangmini tried to kick, he either just kick into the check or Tananchai would just circle or pivot off away from his rear leg. And when Sangmini did land the few kicks that he did, uh, Tananchai would urgently counter counter to with his own kick. Tananchai was doing a lot of good work with his hands in this fight. While he was marching him down in that square stance, he'd fire off short, long punches at the shoulder. They're kind of like half jab, half straights from a square stance that don't have the commitment or tell of a full, full, fully powered straight, but they still land hard because of his length and because of the leverage from his stance. So instead of... <clears throat> it's kind of like a, the thing that Tony Ferguson does where he throws 
those like anchor jobs. So he'll he'll be in like a weird square stance and he'll throw his lead hand, but because he's square, he can power it more with by shifting his weight to the opposite leg. I was talking to um, some people about Tony Ferguson recently, and I showed them this fight and joked that Tenanchai is what a good version of Tony Ferguson would look like. And I'm sure you could find good versions of all pretty much any MMA fighter in Muay Thai, except for maybe Johnny Walker. But yeah, he was throwing those kind of Tony Ferguson straights where he'd have the square stance and then power it with like a back step uh, into the opposite stance. So the jab would land harder than expected. And he was able to land these long punches while also staying out of range for, from saying these punches up and walking him down at the same time. Sangmini's game relies a lot on the synergy between his boxing and his kicks. Um, he'll like establish the straight left, and then once guys are, are waiting on it, he can go to work with kicks and then pair the punches and kicks together. That's how he, he beat Tao and Chai in his last fight. In their first fight, Tao and Chai was catching his kicks consistently and countering, and then in the rematch, Sangmini would pair it with his punches. So when Sangmini went to catch his kicks, he'd get punched in the face, and then the catches stopped being as effective because he was worried about getting hit in the face. So saying when he was able to play the kick and the straight left off each other. But he wasn't really able to get either of those going here. Tenanchai also did a really good job of landing some off rhythm counters with that squared up straight to dissuade Sangmini from advancing. When Sangmini tried to come forward he would he would um <clears throat> get popped with like a short little arm punch and then Tenanchai would move away before he could do anything about it. So yeah, Sangmini was really nullified and not able to get anything going. Tenanchai was a bad matchup for him, as well as being like a normal, fully grown adult, while Sangmini is like the size of a 15-year-old boy. Kupayak, Jitmoinan, and Lamnamoon, or Acharya. Kupayak is ranked number 5 at Roger Damnern's 126-pound division, and number 3 at Lumpney's. Lamnamunlek is number 6 at Roger Damron's 130-pound division, and number 2 at Lumpany. So I think Q Pyek was going up in weight here. Q Pyek's on a pretty big win streak recently, and he was voted, um, I think, the Thai Sports Writers Fighter of the Year in 2019, which is the most prestigious award in Muay Thai. But Lamnamunlek did a pretty good job of nullifying him here. He, he stayed just a step outside of Q Pyek's kicking range and tried to goad him forward. And would time round kicks when he stepped in. Both guys were trying to land the rear, rear, rear round kick to the body, but Lambda Moonlek was a bit sharper and he was quicker to block Kupayek's kicks. He stood in a really square stance while Kupayek was more bladed and heavy on the rear leg, so he had an easier time lifting his leg up to check. Lambda Moonlek also did a great job of counter kicking. When, when Kupayek would try to kick him, he'd catch and return the kicks. And then when Lambda Moonlek would kick himself, he would, instead of aiming like directly on the body, he'd often tar almost target the forearms. So q Pyek would have a harder time catching the kicks. If you kick the body, it's a lot easier to get off a clean kick, but also you're kind of kicking up into their armpit. So it's very natural to catch it. But if you're kicking at their forearm, if they're not going to like lean back and just slip it entirely, the only thing they can really do is block it. It's hard to... To like get your arm up high enough to actually catch that, you can do the, the scoop catch where you catch it on your forearm and then scoop under it with the opposite arm, but that's harder and not quite as reliable. But um, and when he did go to the body, he would make sure to set it up well so that he could throw it without so much risk of having it caught. He was feigning really effectively to keep Kupayek at distance, and he was also able to draw out kicks to counter with those feints. Q Pyek had most of his success when he was able to put his punches and kicks together using hip feints and punching combinations uh, to set up the rear body kick. It would have been nice to see Q Pyek commit, commit a bit more to his hands and try to hide kicks behind punching combinations since he was losing the outside kicking battle, but his punching entries were also giving Lamna Moonlek opportunities to kick as well. Q Pyek had some success with a teep earlier in the fight that I would like to have seen him gone back to especially with the way Lam Moonlek was actively blocking with his rear leg. He was standing square, and then when Q Pyek tried to throw the round kicks to the body, he would lift his rear leg up and check it. And those, the square stance and rear leg, light rear leg, leave the teep open. 
but Lambda Moon like also did a good job of countering the keep a few times, so it might have dissuaded Kupai. Pet Yutong or Quan Wang and Rungkit bore Rung Rot. Rungkit fought Pet Yutong a while ago, I think it was last year, and he finished him with Lay Kicks in the third round. This this time it went a different way. Pet Yutong is ranked number four in Lumpany's 135 pound division and number eight at Rajadanran. Rungkit is ranked number three at, in Rajadanran's 135 division and number five in Lumpany. The fight started as an outside kicking match that Pet Yutong was getting the better of. He was playing his round kick and teep off each other, doing a better job of countering and blocking Rungkit's kicks. And he landed a few really nice sneaky head kicks by establishing the leg kick and then kind of like looking down and getting Rungkit biting on them before coming over the top with a head kick. Rungkit started pressuring later after he was getting out kicked on the outside. He was able to do a bit of work in the clinch with knees, but Pet Yutong was able to stall him out or like trip him and off balance him and then get out. Rungkit's aggression also gave uh, Pet Yutong the opportunity to land some counters. He landed a big counter elbow and left hook in the third when Rungkit was coming forward. The more aggressive Rungkit had to get because he was losing the outside kicking, the worse he did. Pet Yutong had a much easier time kicking when Rungkit pressured as opposed to when he was trying to fence with him at range and he'd land kicks to the forearms and body consistently as Runkit advanced. It's harder to, a lot harder to check kicks when you're advancing than when you're kind of camped out at range, and Runkit wasn't doing the marching footwork, like where, you, where you're shifting stances and picking your legs up. He was coming forward within his stance, so that, that makes it harder too, because he's not constantly picking his legs up. He had his weight more set, and when he wants to come forward, he has to step with his front foot first, and there's not a lot of opportunity to check there. <clears throat> so, Pet Yutong was able to lead him onto his kicks. And he didn't have to worry about Runkit pulling back to... Um, if, you, if you throw a head kick, the, ties, the way ties defend that, they don't want to block it because kicks in the forearm score points. They want to like pull their head back and just slip it entirely. But with Runkit coming forward, Pet Yutong didn't really need to worry about disguising the head kicks because he... His momentum was already taking him into the kick, so he just needed to time his forward movement. Pet Yutong did a really good job of tying Runkit up in the clinch when he was trying to pressure box late. Runkit wasn't able to draw out, draw out his slips and punish him. He would kind of flurry on the ropes and then get clinched. Runkit's a really good boxer on the outside, but when he has to pressure and swarm, he doesn't really have the, the skills to like play around with a jab a bit and get guys reacting and then capitalize on those reactions. So it was a really good performance from Pet Yutong, who I think has been on a bit of a skid lately. And then finally on this card, Pet Samjit Jitwangnan fought Pet Somai Sor Somai. <clears throat> Pet Samjit, both Pet Samjit and Pet Somai fought on the on the last last road show, I think a month ago. I covered that on my podcast. Pet Samjit beat up Sit- was it yeah it was Satan Wenglak, and Pet Somai got he lost to Runger. Pet Somai is the Rajadamnern 112 pound champ, and Pet Somai is ranked number 7 at Rajadamnern's 112 division, and number 3 at Lumpenies. Pet Somai, Pet Somai was coming off, a, I think, a four fight losing streak in this fight, too, and he, he put on a really good performance against Pet Somjit. Pet Somai was using a nice counter lead leg body kick when Pet Somjit advanced. It, his body kick helped. He keep um, Pet Samjit's right hand pinned to his guard so he couldn't freely hit with it. And it also allowed him to prevent Pet Samjit from jabbing in and closing distance well. Pet Somai also, also used the left kick nicely when he was exiting the pocket. When Pet Samjit was, was coming in and he was trying to intercept him, he'd throw a switch kick. But when he was throwing it on exit from the pocket, he'd just step, step backwards into it rather than taking a long switch. So he'd come in with like a boxing combination and then just quickly kick him on the way out. Pet Somai did a lot of good work with combination punching to get around Pet Samjit's long guard. He was using his left hook well to set up kicks and knees. Uh, he was using leg kicks to enter into punching combinations, so break his balance with the leg kick, kick him out of stance, and then pounce on him with some punches while he's trying to recover. And he did a good job of countering Pet Samjit's kicks with his punches. Pet Somai would set himself up an extra step away from Pet Samjit, so he had to close distance in order to strike. And then when he tried to step into him, he would counter kick, sort of like the old Machida game plan, but with counter kicks instead of the counter straight. If Pet Samjit tried to kick with him from the outside, 
uh, Petsoma I would catch it and either trip him or throw the leg aside and hit him. When Petsom just started coming forward, he'd frame off the biceps or use a knee shield when he tried to clinch, which, which let him create distance and hit. Later in the fight, Petsomjit realized he was losing the distance striking and he, he was forced to pressure more. So Petsomai started using disruption tactics like pivoting off his jab and left hook to avoid being trapped on the ropes. He used a strong side deep to maintain distance and he'd feint it to enter pocket exchanges safely. He also used a lighter teep off the back foot while Petsomjit was advancing to, to like jam his hip just so he couldn't transfer weight into it and step forward. Looked a lot like the, uh, the teep that Rangarai uses, which he used a lot against Petsomai a month ago. Petsomai looked really good. It really shows you how strong the competition is in Muay Thai, when a guy on a four-fight losing streak can dunk on, a, on the champion of a strong division given the right matchup. On Wednesday the 26th, Rangarai Kiatmukau fought Shanlart Minayathan. This was a really great fight. I'm a huge fan of Rangarai too. Uh, he's a really slick little outfighter, super sound defensively, the kind of fighter that I usually like a lot. Uh, he's probably my favorite active Muay Thai fighter. Shout out to my colleagues at the fight site, Luca Bordon and Baba. I also love Rangarai. Shanlart is currently the Lumpany 115 pound champion. He actually won the belt from uh, Rangarai back in December. In a fight, I thought Rangarai should have won. I thought that was kind of a robbery. Rangarai is ranked number three at Roger Damron's 115-pound division right now, and number one at Lumpany. Chandler was trying to pressure him back to, the, back to the ropes and open up his boxing. He was using a consistent lead leg round kick to try and cut Rangarai off and pin him in place. He wasn't able to get a ton done, though. Rangarai mostly controlled this fight. He was using jabs and teeps really nicely to, to um, maintain his distance and keep an extra step away from Chandler. Uh, everything Rangarai did here was about denying Chandler at the pocket, um, preventing him from like opening up with his boxing and keeping him at either kicking distance or in the clinch. When Chandler tried to close distance to, to land his punching combinations, Rangarai would step into the clinch or he'd counter with knees or kicks. He was doing a really good job controlling Shanlert's hands on when he was entering to defuse his boxing. So he'd attack with like hand traps and he'd just kind of like push on Shanlert's hands and keep pressure there so he wasn't able to to like impede the path of his jab to force him to hook around the hands so the punches would be wider and easier to see. Rangarai uses a really unique guard. He does the um the normal long guard. But instead of having his rear hand extended, he'll fold it over his across his face, kind of like an old-school boxing cross-arm guard. Another thing I love about Rangarai's defense is that his guard is super responsive. You see a lot of guys just kind of like hold the long guard out there. If you watch Yod Panamrung's two fights with um, Pen Payek Sichev Buntham, he was doing the he would hold his hands out in the long guard or the Dracula guard, and he would just kind of keep them there, and it gave. Panpayek a bunch of opportunities to work around it. He'd carve him up with uppercuts uh, and then to get him to like close in with his hands and then hook around his head. He'd go to the body and back up to the head. But Rangarai, he doesn't just leave his hands out there. He can see punches coming and adjust as necessary. So his his rear his lead hand would be extended barring the right hand, barring Chandler's right hand, and then his his own rear hand, his right hand would be doing whatever it needed to do based on Chandler's actions. If he was going with left hooks, Rangarai would have it tight to his head in like an answering the phone kind of high guard thing. If he was jabbing, if he was at jabbing range and trying to close distance, Rangarai would have it extended to control his hand. And if he was uh, like trying to tee off in the pocket, he'd have it folded across his face in that long guard kind of thing. And again, he doesn't just stand there while he's doing it. He uses it in combination with his footwork. So he, he would use like a jab or teat to keep Chandler on the outside. And then as soon as he got him back to the ropes and started closing into the pocket, he, he would take like a combination on his guard and then immediately circle out or teep him off again. Rangarai was landing some really nice counter kicks and knees. He would, he'd pull back whenever Chandler tried to fire off his right hand. So he'd, he'd be keeping like an extra step away so Chandler would have to step in twice to, to meet him in the pocket. And then when Chandler tried to step in and fire off the right hand, he'd just skip back a step and knee him in the body or kick him as he tried to, to follow up and close distance with his lead hand. There was some really sick uh, hop-step knee counters that he landed there. 
he'd also use it the the knee the counter knee to the body as a trigger counter in close range so when Chandler, whenever he felt the the right hand on his guard or even if Chandler landed the right hand he'd immediately fire off a knee and it would catch Chandler as he was opening up with his lead hand to try and continue the combination uh because when he's throwing that left hook it leaves the ribs on his left side exposed for the for running around his right knee he made great use of that counter knee throughout the fight he was consistently countering Chandler's lead leg kicks with his own kicks. He'd either check it or pull back and then land his own. There's some really lovely footwork for Rungarai in this fight, too. He was executing gorgeous pit pivots after exchanges. He was often keeping Chandler at a diagonal angle to him on the ropes. Instead of Chandler uh, like coming right in at, at him and backing him up straight to the ropes, he would angle off and force Chandler to turn to keep up with him but he'd keep him at that angle and not allow him to turn. So he'd end up, Chandler would end up having to sidestep before he could turn to face Rungarai, and Rungarai could keep him there and circle around the ring. He maintained the angle with kicks to the arms really well. So when Chandler was at that kind of diagonal angle to him, what it would look like is they're both in orthodox stance. Chandler wouldn't be facing his center line, but would be kind of a step to his, a step to his right. And Rungarai would be slamming kicks into his arms to impede him from circling to keep up with Rungarai. He'd also keep him off while circling and use that hand fighting to prevent Rungarai or to prevent Chandler from squaring him up. Rungarai did a lot of nice work with leg kicks too. He was landing those short little inside leg kick sweeps on the ropes when Chandler closed distance to disturb his balance, where you just kind of like, you're not slamming the kicks in hard, but just kicking their ankle out. To um to like push their leg off balance and disturb their combination, especially for uh such a combination heavy boxer like Chandler, if you can take the the uh, weight off his lead leg, then he can't set his feet to to throw like to to throw the two and then come back up with the left hook and throw the right hand again. He was using outside leg kicks with the rear leg to angle off real well too. He would um like sidestep with his lead leg while he was throwing the pivot off them. When Chandler pushed forward into the clinch, Rungarai would control his biceps on the inside or wedge his forearm inside um, like Rungarai's elbow to, to get inside control and then push off to create space. So the whole fight was basically Rungarai uh, nullifying Chandler's boxing and preventing him from getting to the pocket, either keeping him on the outside and working, picking him apart with jabs and teats. Uh, clinching him up when he got into the pocket, or dissuading him and punishing him from using his boxing with those counter kicks and counter knees. On Monday the 24th, Luk Nimit Singh Kongsi fought Ginsanlek Torlaksong. I've seen like seven different spellings of Ginsanlek. Ginsanlek, Ginchanglek, I don't know. I'm just going to say Ginsanlek. Luk Nimit is ranked number one at Roger Dandern's 126-pound division and number seven at Lumpany. Ginsanlek is ranked number 6 at Lumpany's 130-pound division, so Luknamit is fighting up in weight a bit here. This fight was basically just Ginsanlek putting on a southpaw kicking clinic. Um, he was using a southpaw double attack really well, feinting his left straight to land kicks and vice versa. He was working with the straight to the body real nicely too. He was also kicking Luknamit's rear leg a lot. Rear leg kicks are great if you can land them because... The idea is that everybody, especially in a kicking heavy sport like Muay Thai, everyone conditions their lead leg very well, and it's hard to to do a lot of damage kicking the rear the lead leg because a Thai is is used to it. They're they're ready to check it. Uh, they often don't have a lot of weight on it, and when you do kick it, they're they're used to it. But the rear leg doesn't get conditioned as much. There's often more weight on it, so it's harder to check, and guys aren't expecting it, so it's often easier to sneak those in. But the trade-off is that you need to get you need to get really close to kick the rear leg, and it's hard to throw a kick in such close range without inviting a counter. So you need to to be doing something to ensure that you aren't countered. Uh, one way that you see guys do that a lot, if you look at Cedric Dumbe fights, he kicks the rear leg a lot, and he sets it up through the hand fight. So he'll control guys' hands, and then when he has their their rear hand disarmed, so they can't pop him in the face while he does it. He'll kind of hop step into into the kick to the rear leg. Gin Sanlek was getting him biting on on his rear straight, 
And then when Luknamet would pull back or try to defend that, he'd pop him in the rear leg. He was also doing a, a neat thing where whenever Luknamet would square up in an exchange, um, when you when you like throw a kick yourself, you, you're briefly square while you're retracting your leg. Or if the kick falls short, often they'll step forward with their rear leg and then kind of end up square. Whenever he did that, Ginsen, like would take the opportunity to, to kick the rear leg. Also on exit from clinch exchanges, where you haven't quite recovered your stance yet, you're briefly standing square and the rear leg's vulnerable, and Ginsan like would land them there too. When Luknamit kicked himself, Ginsan like did a really great job of catching and sweeping or breaking his balance with leg kick counters. When Luknamit threw the orthodox rear leg kick to the open side, Ginsan like would just catch it and then either sweep and dump him on the ground, or he would like intercept it with a leg kick to break Luknamit's balance. When looking at through his lead leg, Gin Sanlek would just kind of scoop it under his arm and then toss it to the inside to give himself a dominant angle and then counter kick. Um, Gin Sanlek did a good job of landing high kicks to the arms. Like I was talking about earlier, in Muay Thai, you usually want to lean back to defend head kicks because blocking, blocking them scores. And if you want to see why, just watch um, Sangmini's last fight in one where he busted that guy's arms up, took a pick after the fight, his arms were like totally red and bruised. Even Takeru in his fight with um who was it, Yad Kitsada, he took like four four kicks to the arms and there's a big there's a photo of his forearms with a massive bruise on them. But um Ginsanlek would get looked him at biting on the on the rear straight and then kick his arms while he wasn't expecting it. So we wouldn't give him time to do the lean back thing. Luknamit eventually started trying to move forward a bit more and tried to clinch with him, but Ginsanlik would frame off to keep him on the outside and then kick on the exit, or just keep hop stepping back and hammering his leg as Luknamit moved in. There was one point where Ginsanlik landed a counter kick to Luknamit's rear leg and he checked it, but Ginsanlik saw him buckle a bit and just started hammering the shit out of his rear leg. He hit him with th like three straight kicks to the rear leg. So it was a really nice performance by Ginsan. Like, I think he's coming off a, a knockout loss over Tananchai. I don't know if he fought after that, but it was a nice return to form from him. Also on that card on Monday was Fab and Me Bird Ranks It against Fet Mwang Not, Pet Mwang Not, Jit Mwang Not. I showed a lot of people this fight earlier because it was really good. I'm a, I've become a huge Fab and Me stand recently. He's awesome. He's a Moy Mat, um, someone who works mostly with their hands and punching combinations and leg kicks. But he has an interesting, unique style. He fights out of a really square stance, so he's it's harder for kickers to deal with. And he does a lot of kind of tricky lateral movement and stance switching. If you watch his last fight, I, I think it was against Panamrung or something like that. Panamrung, I think the guy's name was. But he was doing a lot of cool pivoting stuff and stance switching. Um, here, this fight was just a banger. It was awesome. Fab and me did some really nice combination work with his hands. He was using left hooks to the body to set up head strikes and using his kicks to enter into big punching combinations. Pet Mwang Not started crowding him later, to not, to trying to deny him the space to open up with his combinations. And then it started off as like kind of a, like a pocket boxing match and kicking fight, and then they ended up just elbowing the shit out of each other. Pet Moingnot started landing some really nice counter elbows. He'd wait for Fab and me to throw his right hand, either to punch with it or elbow with it, and then come back with his, his own elbow as Fab and me reset. Fab and me, after he started pressuring more and getting on the inside, Pet Moingnot kind of took over for a little while, and then Fab and me just smoked him with a big counter elbow of his own. Uh, he caught Pet Moingnot squaring up. He, and he like hand trapped him to to pry his guard off and elbowed him in the face. Fab and me did some really nice stuff with his kicking game. Uh, he would throw a teep and then switch off the reset right into a southpaw body kick. His teep looked good throughout the fight. He'd use it to get some distance when Pet Moingnot was trying to pressure and set up counters. There was one point where he teeped Pet Moingnot away twice and then he kind of pushed forward more aggressively like out of frustration and ran himself onto a massive counter hook. Pet Moingnot started having more success with his own kicks later. He kind of wore Fab and me down a little bit with his right body kick, and he started countering 
Babamese switch kicks. They were clinching a lot later in the fight, but they, they used the clinch to continue exchanges, not for like, it wasn't like a positional clinch battle. They would frame in the biceps or the head, but leave a lot of space so they could punch. So they weren't really like looking to tie up so much as just disturb the other guy's balance so they could get an opening to elbow or throw a punching combination. Kent Wangnott had a lot of success push, pushing Fab and me back with his frames and then kicking when his weight wasn't there to check. So he'd like push him off or frame him off. And then while his balance was br briefly broken, he had an opportunity to land a free kicks. It ended up being scored a draw, which seems pretty fair. It was one of those fights where it's hard to pick a winner. Pretty much everyone involved wins. They both come out looking better. And do we really need a winner in fights like these? The point was them beating the complete shit out of each other. And they both seem to do it about as effectively as one another. So a draw seems like a fine result. I think we should probably have more, more draws in MMA rather than flipping a coin in fights like these anyway. I had a couple of people ask me about the dance battle at the end of the Fab and Me uh, pet why not fight. So I'll address that here. When a tie has a big lead in the last round, they'll usually spend it dancing off. It's kind of like a posturing thing, like, I've already won the fight, it's up to you to come get me now. Um, that's why we see the, like, the third and fourth rounds are the most important for scoring. If it's close, you'll usually see guys bang it out. But if one has a good lead, they'll, they'll usually kind of just dance around, and then you'll see, like, a glove touch, where sometimes the, the loser will indicate that he lost, and be like, yeah, okay, you got me, that's fine. And they won't really contest it. Sometimes they'll, like, they'll go hard. And you'll have to, you'll see the guy who's winning be like intermittently dancing off and then he'll like pause to, to fight when the guy comes to exchange and then he'll like skip away and then dance off again. Uh, sometimes you see like mutual dance offs when both guys think they won. In this case, I think there was some of that. And also they, they'd fought so hard for the past few rounds. They didn't really s just start in the third round either. This, this fight got started a bit earlier. So I think both guys were like, okay, yeah, that's, that's basically enough. These guys fight uh, like once, sometimes twice a month. So in Muay Thai, preserving there's a, there's a lot of thought to like preserving their health. Um, if they're down big in the fifth round, they're usually not going to sell out and risk getting getting seriously hurt or anything. They'll just be like, okay, fine, I lost this one. I'll get them. It, I'll get them when I fight again in like three days. But yeah, if you haven't watched this fight, and if you're going to pick any, any of the fights I've talked about today to see, i definitely recommend this. It was a hell of a fight. These guys just beat the shit out of each other for like 15 minutes. Um, on Sunday, February 23rd, Yadvicha fought Satan for Rachanon. Yadvicha, he's been away from elite Muay Thai for a long time. I think like four years or so. He kind of fucked off to the international circuit after losing to Litawada. In, I believe it was 2016? Yeah, it was 2016. So he has, he's been fighting foreigners for a while. And in Muay Thai, he was a, a big pressure clinch guy. He'd storm forward, grab guys around the head, and then try to knee the shit out of their midsection. In his kickboxing, he's developed a lot more, more of a conventional striking game. Um, more, more boxing-heavy approach. And he uses his kicks better. I think he also just kind of grew out of stadium Muay Thai. He couldn't really cut the weight anymore. He's a big boy. He's, he's fighting at 155 pounds now, and you don't really see much elite Muay Thai at, at that weight. It's kind of the, the light heavyweight or heavyweight of, of ties. But he was fighting Satan for Rachanon here for some kind of title. It wasn't like an important title, but they were fighting at 155 Satanfa is ranked number 10 in Raj Damnern's 147-pound division. So this is the, the first kind of legit Nakmoy that Yadvich has been fighting in a while. Unless you count Sorgra, which I guess you can, but I don't really. He's technically a Lumpany champ, but it's at, like I said, it's at like 100 and... I think it... Sorgra is at 160, which is like almost getting up to super heavyweight range. But... Yadvich looked amazing. He, he did a really good job of pressuring and controlling distance with his jab and teep. This is a, a really perfect fight to watch in order to, to see how like long-range tools like the jab and teep link with inside work, like clinch and elbows. Yadvich was pairing his, his distance work really well with his inside game. He was using thudding jabs and teeps to, to help his pressure and force Satanfa back. So he'd, he'd come forward behind like a ramrod jab and slam the teeth into his midsection. 
to make a move backwards, and Yadovich is the kind of guy who wants to get you in the ropes and wants to clinch you up. He also used a, non, a nice non-committal kind of flitting jab when, he, when Satanfa came forward to occupy his vision and keep him from getting any momentum together. He couldn't like sustain any kind of pressure game or push Yadovich back himself because he was always keeping that in his face. And he paired the jab and teep together really well. He was feinting the teep to enter range and then landing his jab, and he was, like teeping off his jab, using teep feints to enter and everything. Yadvich did a really lovely job of combining his jabs and elbows too. He was jabbing into his elbows really well. He would, he would jab in to draw the high guard and then step into an uppercut elbow or like a horizontal elbow to cut up the guard, either slice through it or elbow around it. In the second round, Yadvich started working his clinch game. He was getting to his side lock. I've talked about that a bit before on the podcast, but basically what Yadvich, uh, the position he likes in the clinch, instead of uh, like coming straight in and wrapping around their head from when their hips are square to each other, he'll try to angle out to the side and then wrap deep around their head. So it's kind of like a headlock with an arm in. And from that, from that position, they can't really do much. Um, the ref will usually break it up quick because they don't like those kind of locks. But he'll have like two seconds to, to knee them in the belly freely. And they can't like, there's an opportunity for guys to frame off when he's entering it. Like Little Water did that a lot. And he basically he kept him from the getting into his positions by controlling his hand and his head in the clinch. But once he has the, once he has the arm around the neck and he's pivoted to the side, it's really hard to kind of like get out of that, especially with Muay Thai rules. Cause you can't like drop for a takedown or anything or like, or just like trip him out, trip his leg out. So he was doing the side lock to Satan Fluff. Uh, he was feigning teeps into stepping knees to enter the clinch, so he'd lift his leg up like he was about to teep, and then set it down and knee on the body real quick, and then grab a hold of him while he was still reacting to the knee. Once Satanfo was able to frame off and create distance in the clinch, Yadvich would post on his face to obscure his vision and go to work with elbows. He finished him with an elbow from that kind of position where Satanfo was trying to create distance, and he would frame off just to blind him a little bit and then elbow him in the face. It was a really great performance from Yadvicha. I'd really love to see him uh, start taking more dedicated Muay Thai fights. He's a bit too big to compete with the elite right now. Um, The best divisions in Thailand are around 120 to 130-ish pounds. Kalanchai and Sangmini and all that, I think, are at 135. And Yadvicha is at 155 right now. But I hope he takes more Thai fights, because I I really miss seeing him, seeing his clinch game and elbows and everything. Finally, our last fight is Kompet, Kompet Sitsarawatsa versus Fapenang Porlakun. That was on Monday, February 17th. Kompet is the Lumpany 118-pound champion, but he's coming on a, off a losing streak here. I think he's, he was on a four-fight skid. Um, I don't know who Fapenang is, and as far as I can tell, he's not ranked, which might be why Kompet dealt with him so easily. But Kompet just put on a clinic of body work, just completely destroyed his body. He was landing consistent intercepting knees. Um, whenever Fapning would come forward, Fap, Fapin, I don't even know. Whenever the other dude would come forward, he'd be met with a intercepting knees to the body. Kompet was landing teep faint knees where he'd lift his leg up to show the teep. And then as soon as Fapin, Fapin, sure, as soon as that guy reacted to it, he'd step into the knee to the body. He was switching stances into southpaw to knee the other side, so he was working both sides of the body actively. It was interesting to see, because usually when you think of strong knee-based performances, they come from pressure, like guys pushing the other dude back to the ropes and then stepping into knees when, they're, when their stance squares up on the ropes and they have nowhere to go. But Kompet was, was out fighting. He was keeping him at long distance and still kneeing the shit out of him, working off the back foot. He was using long-range jabs and body kicks to draw Fapenang onto the knees. He would, he would like flick out jabs or body kicks from range, and then when Fapenang tried to, tried to counter, to move forward to counter, he'd be met with the knees. And yeah, Fapenang just got destroyed with intercepting knees over and over. Compet was befuddling him with jabs and low kicks. He used some some really nice outfighting footwork too, squaring his stance to move laterally. Later in the fight, Fapanung tried to push harder into the pocket, and Kompet started ducking into body locks, like um, 
KNR was doing to Rotting. And then in the fifth round, Compet landed a, a massive teep to the body that knocked Fapanung over from the accumulation of body work, and he was like slow and lethargic to get up, and the ref just called off the fight. It's a cool thing about Muay Thai refs. They're a lot, they seem a lot more aware of what's going on in the fight than other refs do. Like, there's almost no sport where, no other sport where well, they'll, they'll call the fight so early, but they always seem to know what they're doing. Like, if you see a guy get their head dragged down and knee a couple times, a tie ref will usually call that. Because if you're, if a tie is getting kneed in the head, it's pretty much over. There's already something gone terribly wrong. Usually it's because of some kind of, like, accumulation, like this was. Like, they've gotten their body beaten up so bad, or they're so tired that they can't, they just don't have it in them to maintain their posture. And if you see a tie getting broken down and kneed in the face, there's, like, that's it. They're done. And this was kind of like that. Like, there was any kind of kickboxing or MMA fight, they would have let them go on. But Fapanung was, he didn't have much left. He was getting his body wrecked throughout the fight. And even though this was the first big moment of something like, something really drastic happening, it was obvious that there was no real way for him to come back from it. So it's always cool to see Muay Thai refs upstaging everybody else. There was that, that clip Yadsnan posted on Twitter. I think it was Yadsnan a while ago where the, the Thai ref like dived under the guy's head to catch it as he was getting knocked out. And that went viral. It got like a million views on Twitter. But that's a pretty regular occurrence for Thai refs. They're the best in the business for sure. And yeah, I think that about covers the important action over the past couple of weeks. I wanted to talk about some upcoming fights, but I guess that's not going to happen because it doesn't look like there's going to be any upcoming fights. Jadvich, I think, was scheduled to fight on March 15th, which will have been a couple days after I released this podcast. But I doubt that fight's going to go through. But yeah, it seems like everything in the foreseeable future is going to be cancelled. If there's, if there's a, a big gap where I don't have anything to talk about for a couple of weeks, I'll try to rope one of my fight site colleagues into watching a bunch of classic fights, and we'll do a, a Golden Age discussion podcast. I'll get Danny to watch a bunch of... I've been getting Danny to watch a bunch of um, Wang Chinoni Sword Palanchai fights, and I'm turning him into a Wang Chinoni stan. So I'll have Danny on to talk about Wang Chinoni. And then Tom can come on, and we'll, t- we'll discuss Chen Wok Pet. And that'll keep you, hopefully that'll keep you guys entertained over the break. As always, thank you for watching the show, and remember to wash your hands for at least 20 seconds. They hands and feet, and balls and knees. This is an art of boxing you would all love to learn. Ooh, Suck them hard with your soul and then kick out and all.